this is our first guest lecture series, which is part of the Black Girl Life Fellowship. Um, the fellowship is two years old, um, but it's basically a space that commissions and produces stories by Black queer uh, women. Um, it's an experimental space. It's a collaborative space. It's a space for playing and ideas uh, and failure and research and networking. Um, as part of the fellowship this year, we thought we'd explore a guest lecture series where we invite uh, storytellers, uh, different kinds of storytellers from various backgrounds to think um, about space, archiving, uh, image making or unmaking and unmaking as Manuel is going to talk about in their lecture um, and the possibilities of storytelling. Um, the first uh, guest in the series is uh, Maneo Mohale, um, who is an editor, feminist writer, and poet. Um, their work has appeared in various local and international publications. They've served as a contributing editor for the New York Times and ID, among others. They've been long listed for all of the awards, including being the youngest finalist shortlisted for the Ingrid Yonker Poetry Prize. Their debut collection of poetry, Everything is a Deathly Flower, won the Glenna Luchet Prize for African Poetry. They are an incredible mind and spirit. And babes, we are so honored to have your scholarship as part of the series and I will now hand over to you um, to speak to us um, on uh, your lecture tonight against sisterhood, who gets to be and who gets to see. Oh my word. Um, I'm, hi everyone. <laughs> um, um, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much for the opportunity um, to speak to you all. Um, and yeah, I'm very nervous, but also it's it's like the kind of nervousness that's uh, that derives from a deep excitement and a deep uh, um, sort of exploratory impulse. Um, I want us to kind of think together. It's less of a lecture and it's more me throwing up questions um, and um, musings um, for anyone who hasn't necessarily heard me read or like heard me speak before. Um, I'm definitely the babe who um, preferences a lot of close reading. So we're gonna do a, a little bit of that tonight. I'll read to you and we'll hook thoughts in and out um, and we'll, we'll have a look. Um, I'm just checking if everyone can hear me still. Colleague, are you still? Okay, all good. All right, good, amazing. Um, I am just gonna, all right. Okay, good. Um, all right, so a few disclaimers. Uh, today we're going to be uh, having frank discussions of um, transphobia, mm. successes, sexism. Um, you're going to hear my puppy a lot. He's a little bit barky, and um, so uh, sorry about that as well. Um, we're going to going to meander a little through different texts. Um, and also as someone as, as I think who doesn't really privilege any kind of geolocality, we're kind of going to be moving all over the world, but with a real understanding that um, and an acknowledgement that the global north, specifically the US, takes up an incredible amount of space in the way that we talk about gender and sexuality. I feel you um, and to kind of pin that and understand that, but um, since today we're going to be talking about the image, it's going to be um, tough to uh, speak about black feminist image making and not talk about the, the, the giant empire that uh, controls a lot of the image making. Okay. Um, yes, I, I see that there's a little bit of a, <laughs> something is just, um, uh, there's a suggestion in the chat just to put videos on if it's possible, because um, it's very difficult to kind of talk to a screen and not see anyone. Um, to minimize a little bit of the barking and the yapping, I'm going to put um, my earphones on so you can hear me a little better. Can you still hear me? Are we all good? 
Amazing. Okay, good. All right. Um, so what I really want to start off with um, is a challenge by one of my favorite writers. Her name is Aradati Roy, and I'm sure a lot of you are uh, deeply um, familiar with her work, uh, a novelist, an essayist, an anti-capitalist thinker, an anti-imperial thinker as well. Um, and there's a note on the side of my fridge that is has become a little bit of a, a guiding principle. Um, and I think uh, is a really beautiful point of departure for us to kind of start thinking about um, some of the notions that I'll bring up. Um, so we'll start there and then I'll give a few um, more disclaimers and then we'll get right into it. Okay, so Arundhati Roy uh, in, in an essay uh, uh, called Capitalism, a Ghost Story uh, has this fantastic quote that I think that we'll start off. So our strategy should not only be to confront empire, but to lay siege to it, to deprive it of oxygen, to shame it, to mock it with our art, our music, our literature, our stubbornness, our joy, our brilliance, our sheer relentlessness, and our ability to tell our own stories. Stories that are different from the ones we're being brainwashed to believe. What I love about uh, this quotation um, is that it, uh, uh, illuminates what I think is at the center of a lot of the, the challenges that a lot of us storytellers have, um, especially those of us writing in English, the challenge that our storytellers have in trying to uh, both resist and play into uh, the politics of representation. And also how it uh, illuminates what we're up against, what we're up against is empire, what we're up against are the stories that have been told about uh, black people, about femme people, um, about women, um, and also the stories, uh, a very large part of, of uh, story making and empires um, specifically in the tension within that is the silences in the archives. Uh, all of the stories that we do not have access to at all. And I think what with, with this talk and why I use empire in this particular quotation by Aaron as a as a point of departure is in even thinking around gathering um, around feminist thinking, even with the talk that's called Black Girl Live, um, what is it that we're privileging uh, what is it that we're assuming about how it is that we can gather, who is gathering in this space as a black non-binary writer? Um, girlhood and sisterhood has very often been um, a signal to me about a very specific kind of politic um, that often does not include uh, black, trans, and it's gender non-conforming uh, black people. And um, I think what I want to kind of start at is by um, talking about the image both as a tool that uh, me as a writer that I use as a poet, which is very different from a photographer or a videographer, people that use and work in the visual image. Um, so on one level, I want to speak about what the what power I derive and also what tensions in the power that I have in image making as someone who is very, very, very aware of how rare it is to have black non-binary voices in poetry at a very specific visible level, especially in this country and especially on this continent. And then on another level, I do want to speak about the visual, but um, on the level of pop culture. So the gender non-conforming, non-binary and trans people that we do get to see. And why is it that we do get to see those people? And what does it communicate um, about who gets to be a girl, who gets to be a woman, who, who, do, who do we get to call sister? And also what does this category of sister, of girlness, how fraught is it really? And is there a pathway uh, of organizing and gathering and seeing each other and seeing ourselves that is beyond this uh, very often cis heteronormative framework around sisterhood? Okay, oh, so that was a little wordy. <laughs> Um, and a little bit nerdy, but we'll we'll get we'll get into the the vibes very, um, I hope very organically and with uh, some scattering and with a little bit of musing and, and rambling. I'm definitely a huge fan of the tangent. 
as a system of thought. I'm a huge fan of the sort of word spiral of getting lost. So I hope that you surrender a little bit to my power to do that. I promise I'll keep you relatively safe while also challenging a few ideas and hoping that we can draw a line um, that eventually leads us at the end of the lecture into a challenge that uh, we can perhaps take into our own lives and our own works, especially those of us who are interested in image making and especially those of us who are creators in that space. Um, so I want to start off with uh, a, a really prominent uh, uh, gender non-conforming black woman. I want to start with Laverne Cox. I had an interesting conversation with my partner this morning um, around cisness and transness and her, her name comes up uh, very often. And um, I'm reading this fantastic uh, text and rereading this fantastic text uh, by a, a, a trans theorist, a black trans theorist called C. Riley Snorton. The book is called Black on Both Sides, A Racial History of Trans Identity. It's so good, it's so good. Um, extremely nerdy but very beautiful and I want to read a little bit from the preface um, in which Snowton uh, takes an excerpt from Laverne Cox, one of Laverne Cox's speeches, um, which kind of gets into the nitty-gritty of this idea around image making, but then what I think that uh, Snowton does is that they take us through um, kind of unpacking the uh, the excerpt from the speech, which gets into the, polit the politics of image making, and then I'll kind of separate and read a little bit, and then we can talk about it. So we'll get into it. Don't worry, I got you. All right. So in 2015, while garnering pu publicity for the feature film Grand Bar in a live interview with Robin Roberts on Good Morning America, actress artist and advocate Laverne Cox expressed a public grief. I quote, we in the transgender community right now are reeling. Just yesterday, we found out another trans woman was murdered, Tamara Dominguez. And that makes a total 17 known transgender women who have been murdered in 2015 alone. It really is a state of emergency. Your life should not be in danger simply for being who you are. We have to say these people's names. I think the reasons why trans women experience so much violence has to do with employment, housing, healthcare, etc. So we need to make sure that trans lives matter. Unpacking um, the, that excerpt, Snorton does this really beautiful um, close reading, which we'll first do a close reading of the close reading and we'll kind of get at some of the stuff that I want us to get into, which is a little nitty gritty, but we'll get there. Um, all right, so from this vantage point, consider how Laverne Cox and Cox's designation of a state of emergency to refer to the killings of trans women, most of whom were black and brown sharpens the distinction between the state's rhetorical use of that phrase and the real state of emergency that surfaces as a matter of history. To put it, different, to put it differently, a real state of emergency occurs as a rupture in history to reveal, as Homi Baba has written in his foreword to Fanon, that the state of emergency is always, always a state of emergence in which the event of struggle challenges the idea of time as a progressive ordered whole. As such, Laverne Cox's gesture towards the numerous structural factors and institutional practices of racialized gender that delimit black and brown trans women's life trances expresses territories of violence, sites of vulnerability and precarity and scenes of slow death to which one might read into the etc., the prison systems, asylums, and detention centers. Cox's comment, which emerges as an interruption in the flow of entertainment news to inhere within the disruptive temporality of mourning is articulated with the persistent tense of the present as another indication of a break with te teleological time. 
a lot of language, very wordy, but I think what's really beautiful about what Snorton does is look very deeply into what Cox does in the moment with the use of the word we and the use of the present tense and also the use of the, of the term state of emergency. As South Africans, we are absolutely no strangers if inside of a pandemic to the phrase state of emergency. If we take a, a longer view and think about the 1980s, it's a deeper history that I, I think is very often embodied in black people in thinking about what the state of emergency was under apartheid. But when we think about the image and, and why I'm bringing it um, with Laverne Cox's speech is that in this moment, an incredibly, incredibly visible trans woman who leverages a lot her proximity to empire, um, her ability to kind of move um, in, from activist spaces into entertainment spaces, which is something that I think she does very beautifully <clears throat> in leveraging language and lever leveraging activism in that way. But what I think that Snorton kind of picks up in is that uh, Snorton implicates the audience to say that we, all of us here sitting, have a stake um, and have a responsibility inside of community while also collapsing this idea that community is something that you're just born into. Community is something that you make and it's something that uh, uh, Cox absolutely brings to the fore with the use of the word we. Another aspect inside of this uh, chat and inside of this speech um, is her use of the present tense and also invoking Black Lives Matter language, which is also completely entered into uh, the political framework, into the political conscience and subconscious all across popular media, both in an oppositional sort of way um, by the right wing media in, in, in America, by shortening it to BLM, and then also in a, in a deeply leftist and, and black feminist space to also uh, privilege and also bring to the fore that trans lives are also black lives and black lives are also trans lives. But uh, I think why I, I view this as a challenge um, as, a, as, a, as a poet who deals um, specifically in trying to uh, language violence it's very often that we don't understand the tools that are here in front of us and the power of those tools. And using something like the present tense to talk about violence does something very powerful in saying that not only is this violence situated in this present, in the present tense, that it is ongoing. And also because it is ongoing, we are implicated because we are living in this time. And members of our community, whether we image them and understand them in that sense are, are definitely um, looking to those of us who understand the power of language to both reveal uh, dark edges of marginality while also understanding that power flows through all and everything. Okay, before I get too like rambly about that, um, let me check in, how are we doing? Are we still okay? Are we kind of following? Are we still hearing and, and um, okay, fantastic. Bringing it closer to home, um, I was lucky enough to, uh, to write um, uh, a piece about a documentary uh, that, about the UCT Trans Collective called uh, No Milk, No Honey, No Safe Space. Um, and I want to read a little bit of, um, of, the, of the piece that I wrote, both in the sense that to kind of highlight that a lot of us don't have access to um, images of trans people. Um, we don't have images of and access to images of trans women that are like easily accessible in, in, in popular media. And what that does, obviously, not just in the language of representation, but what that does is that when we think and concept of community and when we think and conceptualize of uh, who it is that 
uh, we look to who we claim as community and who can claim us back as community if we don't see and we don't have access to um, images all we get and what fills up the vacuum are images of violence um, of, of stories and narratives of violence and narratives of social death and what I love about this documentary is that it's uh, beautifully lyrical um, it's gorgeously messy, it's locally made, it's directed by a non-binary person, a local non-binary person, and, it's, and it images uh, uh, black and brown uh, South African trans people. Um, I also want to kind of talk about a very interesting I, um, idea around the, the documentary that the UCT Trans Collective in, initially did not want the documentary to be open to the public and available to the public and that was an internal uh, decision reached by consensus by all of the members of the collective uh, because they felt that if the documentary was released to the public that the people both behind the camera and in front of the camera would face significant harassment um, and in thinking about the stakes of what that means that here is something, an incredible work of visual activism and, and, um, and an incredible piece of art that I was extremely privileged to see. But the same feeling that I felt while I was watching the documentary is like, God, I wish that more people could see this, but I absolutely understand the need to protect um, both the people behind the camera and in front of the camera because of the extremely transphobic and sexist space that we find ourselves in. And when I asked, um, especially the creators and, and the people that were uh, in the documentary about the, more about this decision, <clears throat> uh, a lot of the nuances kind of came out and it's a lot of this sort of chat around, um, we want people to see, but a lot of the violence that we that we face and a lot of the criticism and a lot of the unsafety, the deep unsafety that we feel primarily comes from feminist spaces and feminist spaces that have not and do not want to do the work around thinking about the impact of sexism and why it is that we can only and seem to gather only in, in name only around cis people. Okay, so I'll read a little bit of of the of the piece um, and I hope that I do a kind of good descriptive sort of job um, to kind of speak about to kind of give you an impression of the documentary give me a moment while I find it and very clumsy when it is finding everything okay here we go the problem of language and terminology and its tensions on the African continent raised here in the documentary are well covered in spaces both within and outside the academy. The debates around the importation and influence of theory and terminology from the global north are thorny and complex and the conversations that African thinkers are having around terms like queer and trance are vibrant conversations and nuanced conversations. Here I'm thinking about Pumla Dino Kwala's introduction to the groundbreaking first edition of Queer Africa or the stellar scholarship in publications such as Reclaiming African, Queer Perspectives on Sexual and Gender Identities by Zetuma Tebeni and Af African Sexualities, a reader edited by Sylvia Tamale. How the activists in this documentary add to this debate is consistent with the trans collective mission and slogan to quote, give content to decolonization. For example, Mlingwani Matiwani later insists that quote, there needs to be a decision as to whether it's necessary for us who have found ourselves in white spaces, who have found ourselves in pockets of academia to go and inculcate and bestow this grand knowledge that we now have on poor working class black people in the Eastern Cape. The decision in question posed here by Matiwani is a provocative one and one that is left unanswered in the film. Though activists like Tata Ule and Wendy Lejamini acknowledge the political expedience of the terminology we have now, both express a struggle with language used to describe our identities while hinting at possible directions of exploration and transportation and in imagination. Ule encapsulates this compellingly when she describes the idea of a true queerness. 
she states that the pre-trans trans person is who you are really and this political label trans is a political identity i i identified as trans as a trans person for political reasons at the end of the day we need to move away from these labels and for now adopting the label trans and adopting a kind of language that it brings is more a political act than it is an indication of who you are as a person one of the most powerful visual sequences of the documentary, also featuring Tatopule, seems to mirror the shedding of the expedient of language that we don't need anymore to get to the essential. It's a beautiful scene. Dressed in a form-fitting white dress and a moss green full fur throw, a full fur throw, Pule stands with her hair braided in gray and silver against a red corrugated iron partition. In a voiceover, she speaks about desirability and how it connects to her politics, beginning with the question, what is happening in 2016 in South Africa? She then looks directly at the viewer, her gaze still, assured, defiant. As Kyla Phil's camera ca captures her close up in a muted, dusty palette, Boulet looks away and her thoughts continue in voiceover. She says, we live amongst colonized minds and that have a very particular way of dealing with their attraction towards trans bodies. And it's very violent, it's usually violent. Even though the topic of desire and desirability seems like I want to speak about trans people dating and getting to have partners, like those are legitimate goals to walk in the street with your partner holding hands, just like we see cis people do. But when I speak of desire and desirability, I speak of safety. I speak of me being comfortable in my own body, first of all, being sure of my own desirability and being able to walk on the street and not being afraid. The shot then switches to a slow motion sequence of Bule walking down a busy street in Cape Town city center, almost dream dreamlike in its drowsy speed. Here, Bule speaks about the tensions of repudiation and desire that their embodiment may provoke. She asks, what happens when I'm passing and this black cis-hit man sees my curves and my curv curvaceous body, and when I turn around, they see my beard? In that situation, what could easily happen is that I could get hurt. I am unsafe. Phil then switches the shot to Bule standing against uh, a corrugated background once again, only this time she has shed her fur coat, which lays in a green puddle at her feet. The voiceover continues. How do I respond to that? I hide my body. I stop walking at night. I do all these things that I find my cis woman friends are able to do from a very young age, even though all of us are unsafe. I am internalizing. I am misogyny. I am sexism. In sharp juxtaposition to her words, Bule's face brightens into a smile and she begins to dance. Her white dress animates with the movement of her curves and she laughs at the camera, where Phil captures her in the same syrupy slow motion. It's a strikingly dynamic sequence where we get to see a trans woman delighting in her own body, lit up with her own light, joyful. What I love about the sequence and what I love and what I hope I, I try to kind of give you with the sequence are the tensions around safety and the image. Here we have an image of a, of a black woman, one that most of us, if not all of us in this room, will not ever really get to see because the image itself being in the world is deeply unsafe for the creators as well as the woman in front of the camera. And here we have this incredibly vital discussion. She's here, she's talking about desirability, about politics, about um, embodiment um, and also collapsing this idea right here, right in the forefront of sisterhood because there is a deep separation of experience even though black cis women walking down the street are deeply unsafe. There's a different kind of misogyny that trans women face, namely trans misogyny. And that naming is not about a difference of experience, it's about an imaging of experience, about looking at experience and saying, um, and saying, listen, we are not the same, and yet we are women, and yet we face structural, <laughs> structural violence and harm, but you cannot protect me if you can't see me. 
And there's a deep tension even in me reading about this and, and relaying these images because I'm also thinking about myself as a communicator and medium of, of ideas because I'm deeply concerned about both the creators of the documentary and trying to honor their, their request to say, I'm not going to show you any of this, but also honoring uh, reported speech to say, Buddha's words are extremely important, but also privileging the image to say, it is extremely important, even if it is just in our imaginations, to think we must think in the present tense in order to see who it is that we must organize. We cannot organize if we can't see each other. We cannot organize if we can't hear each other. We can't organize if we can't listen to one another. I think about um, very often about uh, feminists that we look to, like Audre Lorde and Audre Rich, um, who we have ex extensive correspondence of how they try to organize across difference. Audre Lorde being a black lesbian woman, um, Audre Rich being a, a white lesbian woman, a white queer woman, both of them being poets, both of them deeply caring about each other, both of them deeply interested and giving a fuck about each other's liberation. I guess the question that I'm asking is how is it that we can leverage, understand the image while also holding on to this thing that Bule also absolutely talks about around safety? How is it that we can see each other while also keeping each other safe, understanding that we have to see each other? We cannot unsee each other. We cannot unsee each other while we unmake a system of which many of us are subject, even though um, across uh, questions of class and race and ability, of course, and gender, it affects us in 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 very different uh, very different ways and modalities. Um, okay, I, I want to end a little with uh, a little bit more of the essay, and then I want to definitely leave so much space for chatting because it's as open ended as. Um, uh, I suppose as the as as I think about it, it's deeply open ended because these are questions that uh, deeply concern me as as someone um, close to the trans experience, as someone who's non binary, as someone who um, has been subject to, um, and also someone who automatically challenges the notion of sisterhood just by their presence. So the end of the document of the documentary of the essay is a little is my favorite, where everyone um, talks about their most urgent questions. Wandi Lejumini asks a dark and urgent question: How can we continue existing in a world that literally doesn't want us to get help, doesn't want to help out, doesn't want to allevi alleviate our circumstances whatsoever? How does a trans person carry on existing? After a brief pause, Lamini struggles to answer their own question, but presents a reality that many face at the hands of a system that refuses to allow trans people to experience both safety and joy. Lamini admits, to be honest, I have no idea, but I'm doing it. And I think it's because I have this drive. I don't want anyone to go through what I went through. It is this drive that sparked the trans collective into existence at UCT. And as a document of its leaders, thinkers, and dreamers, the documentary is a vital contribution to the archive. Just as the film sets out to destroy the myth that Cape Town is a safe utopia for all, it also insists and emphasizes on a need to create as well as dismantle and destroy. Fittingly, in the closing moments of the documentary, Ninga Numatduani quips, but all in all shame, there's no milk, there's no honey. There's no safe space. The easiest way now is for people to either stop waiting for that to happen or to destroy the institution and create a new one. Thank you. Thank you for that, Manea. So much food for thought. I'm gonna coordinate a Q&A now. A couple of comments did come through while Manea was speaking, um, but if anyone would like to ask them a question, uh, please let me know or you can raise your hand and then I'll just ask you to unmute and then come and ask your question. Laura, I see that you raised your hand. Would you like to ask a question?
Laura, I can't hear you. Is there anyone else who would like to perhaps ask a question in the meantime or make a comment? Just share anything after that. Um, I see that there's a, a, a question in the chat from Khurat that this is so much food for thought, Mana. Is your writing on the documentary publicly available? Yes, um, my writing on the documentary is publicly available. It's in a book uh, published by Un Unisa Press called Beyond the Mountain. But also, if you want it you know, on the low, just um, send me a message and I can send you the PDF. Um, and Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mane. Is there anyone else who would like to share a comment, ask a question? Anyone at all? I, I promise I don't I don't bite, I just nibble. <laughs> Okay, uh, if no other questions, I guess we will begin to wrap it up. Um, Koleko, do you have any closing comments before I close the session? Um, yeah, lots, well, not lots to say. I think, Mano, you've given us a lot of provocations, a lot to think, or well, someone has a question. Okay, but they're saying it needs time. Okay, that's okay. I mean, I think we don't always have to have the questions right away. And sometimes it's also good to sit with things. Um, and you've given us a lot to sit with. Um, yeah, I was <sighs> jotting down some thoughts and some things that were jumping up for me, thinking about your challenge to us about thinking about language, thinking about wielding the present tense as a tool, uh, thinking about who we talk about and think about when we talk about girlhood and sisterhood and community um, where everyone's liberation is at stake, um, thinking about you know, our tensions around image and safety um, and when we archive those images. Um, yeah, you have given us a lot. And for that, thank you. Um, I see someone, um, Jess, posted in the chat. Uh, you mentioned how you are a writer that focuses on language and violence. How do you manage that given the challenges you laid out early on in your talk about the ways we are up against how the empire of image um, if you will, has repeated tropes and stories of blackness, et cetera? Such a good question. Um, brilliant. <laughs> um, I, I go back to um, the, the beginning provocation of the talk um, to, to kind of quote Aaron Betty Roy that, um, that we can't just confront empire. Um, I also think about the Anayir Anari, Wahid um, quote, <laughs> a quotation that we don't always have to be fire and brimstone. Sometimes we can soft water ourselves to freedom. And the, this, this Arundhati Roy quotation is like, sometimes we can mock empire and lay siege to it. And I think my, my personal sort of like toolbox when it comes to kind of, um, coming up against and the challenges that I come up against, especially because I write in English, is by marking and subverting colonial images, by being deeply aware of uh, co colonial imaging, especially of people like me, because inside of, of a colonial imagination, people like me don't exist. How are you not a woman? How is it uh, <laughs> that you are, are queer and your queerness is, is set up in a specific sort of sense? Like, how is it that you are uh, many hearted in many directions? But if I were to privilege images of myself uh, that are given to me, my, given to me uh, by empire, like deeply religious and, uh, images um, and mostly silences in the archive. What I do to mitigate that is to fill that silence up with me. So uh, my first my first collection, 100%, was puncturing a silence around this idea that queer sexual assault doesn't happen. 
um, that queer sexual assault only or sexual assault only happens under a moniker called GBV and under GBV, even under GBV, um, violence against trans women, gender non-conforming people, non-binary people is not necessarily privileged or and if when it is privileged, it is <clears throat> uh, reported in these incredibly violent, inc inc incredibly flattening and a lot of the times uh, misgendering spaces and, and ways and manners. So um, repeated trips and stories of blackness are uh, my pastime, I suppose, sometimes of like uh, reverse engineering that I'm deeply interested in race of tr racist tropes um, and sexist tropes and, and sexist tropes, but I, I have to watch obviously how much I ingest of that uh, by fear of being triggered. But I, I am deeply curious in um, the <laughs> my numerous oppressors ideas of me and 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 narratives of me um because they are so incomplete and and so uh and so often hilariously uh silly so i uh how i um push back against re repeated tropes of invisibility and unmaking and un um is by just filling my voice in the space by being there Thank you, Manu. Jess, I hope that answers your question. I see we have another question here from Miriam. Would you like to come on and ask your question? Otherwise, I'm happy to read it on your behalf. Uh, so Miriam's question to you, Maneo, is I'm very cu curious now about how to safely portray trans and non-binary individuals as a filmmaker and writer who's stepping into the industry. I love this question also because this allows us to talk about power, that um, in, <clears throat> there is very little, if I would say no safe way to portray trans and non-binary individuals if you do not have trans and non-binary individuals in the writer's room behind the camera. Um, at, <laughs> in that sense that if, if it's about a, a question of, of um, representational politics, I suppose, but where I get frustrated with the politics of representation is that it so frequently locks us in discussions around identity and who gets to say and who gets to talk about this and who then do we get to silence and it's less for me about that and more about uh, those who are closest to a very specific experience are the ones who are most qualified to speak about that experience. And it's very often because a capitalist um, matrix is overlaid over identities and over like systems of power and gender and race or whatever, those who are closest to the center are the ones who have the largest and most numerous opportunities to tell stories about those of us who find ourselves on the margins. So if I would then say, if you have power and you are not trans or non-binary, it's to think about how you can uh, subvert, give off, <laughs> um, redistribute, give up, that power and give it to the people who are closest to other very specific and make sure that they get paid as well. And first, firstly, yes. <laughs> Lots of us agree yeah. to that one. Uh, Ziziwe, uh, you have a question for Maneo. Would you like to ask it? Um, first of all, thank you for creating the space for, for Maneo for speaking to us. Thank you. I think it is. An, an amazing endeavor and just thank you, just, just showing appreciation before I begin, I'm going to start. Um, I guess for me, and I'm hoping that this is a safe space where we can all just be honest and just have honest conversations like in the beginning about talking about getting that coin. Some people say as a feminist, you shouldn't get that coin, just dismantle capitalism, but like, fuck it, I want to get paid. So let's just be honest. I think for me, when you were talking in the beginning about trans lives and we matter, I am of the perspective that yes, my freedom is tied to other people's freedoms. And, and yes, I must not be constantly looking at just from my perspective, but I guess sometimes the challenges and particularly as a black woman who has constantly been marginalized, when you're finding yourself in a space 
in a little space, a little gap of privilege. And you're feeling like, you know, there was like this one critique of like um, Black Girls Rock, right? And this is this, it's this award show about in the US about how Black Girls Rock. And the critique was made about like how they're not including like trans women. And interestingly enough, a trans Black woman was just like, you know, for heaven's sakes, these Black women have just got on. Like, can you give them a moment? And for me, I, I, I know my freedom is tied to theirs. There's no way that I want anybody to be marginalized. But you do find yourself at the space where like, and, and it becomes so hard now because if you use the wrong language or the wrong words, you then get accused of not acknowledging somebody's identity. So then you're not allowed to even talk about it. And then you, you know. I totally, I feel you. And I think I want to bring attention to a few things that are already uh, making themselves known. <clears throat> Firstly, thank you very much. Um, and um, I also definitely want to, uh, be careful here while also being blunt. Um, already in, in, in your conception of, um, and, and this is something which is why I, I really love speaking about the structural and, and talking about the uh, structural, because under capitalism and under uh, a very specific sort of like necropolitic, there's this weird obsession on like the individual and the culpability of the individual, which I think is something that you are kind of, you're like gesturing towards, but I also want to kind of um, uh, highlight a danger there also. Um, the first danger that I want to uh, highlight is, and and I suppose make, make it known in, in your language already, is the language of scarcity. And the language, and the language that there is not enough for all of us, and that that is a structural number one. That is that is a structural decision, and that is a deeply institutional, deliberate decision to say. I, I, sometimes I quip it as the Black feminist Hunger Games that they can only be one, and that there is only a, an incredibly small amount of space at the top, and because of that. What that necessitates is that you view everyone next to you as a competition, even if you don't view them that way, which is counter, deeply, deeply counter, extremely black, extremely ancestral, extremely indigenous notions of community. This notion of scarcity is the most anti-black because it is deeply capitalist. You are speaking in capitalism's voice. When you look at a trans woman and you're saying, oh, but you know, there can only be a few and this is my time, your time comes after mine. When a lot of your understanding, a lot of your language, a lot of your organizing, everything that you understand politically about yourself, especially in black feminist language comes from trans women. They were the leaders, they are the leaders, they were the first. So in understand, so this understanding, even like with this example of like Black Girls Rock, like I love that you brought that up, I really do. Uh, because even in the in in the response of the of the 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 woman that you um, you you quoted by saying, but they just got you, but you can hear that in the veying <laughs> that there is a deep like spiritual and humanist separation. There is no they, there was only we, there has only ever been we. But there can never be we, there can never ever be we. Like, and this is the thing that is that is so clear. As Edward Said says this all the time. Oh, and that's my bae, that's my daddy. But he says that those in the center, those closest to the center can only see themselves. Those, think about a concentric, um, a model of concentric circles, like a little circle and then a circle going out and there's like another circle and then like a bullseye sort of situation. Those in the center, which is also a small club, there's not a lot of us that can get through, but those in the center can only see themselves and those who are furthest from the center can see everyone as well as those in the center and themselves. The further away you are from power, the more you see but the less you have access to resources, to safety, to visibility, to human rights, to all, to all of these things, right? To money in thy pocket, put money in thy purse, right? So I think 
what I caution, I suppose, which is why I started with the present tense with we, with state of emergency, but the language that we use is that the language that we use reveals <laughs> capitalism so often speaks in the language that we use. And it is so important to realize when it is that we are speaking in our voice and when it is that we are speaking in a voice that is, that is designed to keep us apart, that benefits. A question that I, I would always pose and give to my housemate, Danica, who was always dealing and always fighting with, with white men is the question to ask yourself when you're not really sure about when you're asked to be doing something or you are faced with something is who does this benefit? Who does this benefit? Who does it benefit when black cis women are the ones that must go ahead of black trans women and black trans women are, are left behind? Who does it benefit when you don't understand the history of black feminist movement that trans women have always been ahead of, of us and then <laughs> black trans women have always been the ones in the forefront and because they were the ones at the forefront, they have always been the ones who are, are most exposed to violence and harm. Who does it benefit not to know that history? Who does it benefit to let other people ahead of black trans women? Because then we do not get at the radical roots of a system in which all of us, all of us, all of us get the short end of the motherfucking stick. All of us hurt. But like I say, we do not all hurt in the same degree because of where we find ourselves in the bullseye. And because of that also, we do not see who gets hurt. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston has this quotation, you know, if you, if you do not articulate your pain, you know, they will hurt you and say that you like that. They will kill you and say that you like that. I'm paraphrasing awfully terribly. I'm so sorry, mama. But the sentiment is there. The, the backbone is there. Does that make sense? Thank you, Maneo, for addressing that. Uh, we have a final question. Horata, would you like to ask a question? Yes. Um, hi, Manil. Thanks so much for this um, offering. I think I've been thinking about the question I wanted to ask, and I think I'm just going to read out what I've written. And I think I hope you can respond. I hope you can find a question in there. The question might be about my question. So I'm thinking about the role of a writer in society. And you being a writer who's quite visible and telling public facing stories, um, how, do you how do you manage the tension, if you'd call it that, between writing as something that gives access to information versus the limitation of what can be shared? Um, or otherwise put a tension between disclosure and visibility and the aid of redressing erasure versus not being able to share and is this attention for you um i'm thinking about a manifestation of violence where one has to be guarded in what they can share and that's something that i'm really struck by in you speaking about um the documentary Horata, thank you for that question it's brilliant it's brilliant and also strikes at the heart of what I think is a deep tension um, of my practice and also um, oh, um, a deep tension, I suppose, uh, also in, uh, in what medium I, I choose to work. So I'm very careful um, and I feel I find myself at the nexus of uh, disclosure and visibility, while also deeply being like suspicious of the tend the tendency for um, under capitalism capitalism to individualize and to hyper individualize. What I mean by this is um, I look to poets. Uh, like <laughs> to trans poets like Kai Cheng Tam, who like push up against this idea that the poet and the public intellectual or the person who wants to write or think in public must be somehow pedestalized, individualized, seen, roped inside of the sort of like a celebrity industrial complex. That there's a tendency, especially inside of communities who 
uh, struggle to find visible people. So like black non-binary poets, like there's not a lot of us, but there are a lot of us, but there's not a lot of us at a, at a specific level. Um, and that's also because of capitalism, because of access, because of who gets to publish us, because of like who publishes are, all of the stuff, all of like the business and capitalist bullshit behind everything. Um, but I think even more on the sense of like disclosure where that rubs up against my, my individualized identities is, is like, is more tender in the sense that as a non, it's very, very recently that I'm out as a non-binary uh, poet. And since then I have absolutely, definitely seen the extreme repercussions and consequences of being out as a trans person, like publishing that people and especially in black feminist spaces and especially invoking like words like sisterhood will include you want you because of like the kind of like clout that it gives the publications like it's very nice to take to say we have a non-binary writer and we are truly feminist inside of this publication but then when it's time to kind of uh uh, defend my pronouns on, in the bio, bio because someone changed them or to she her pronouns then it's a problem when it's time to um, challenge like a blurb on the back of the book for ha perhaps that says that this is a collection of black women writers now it's a problem so in that sense disclosure is also extremely tied to like my bread like my chick like my money you know and in that sense that is so deeply um, unspecial to anyone who finds themselves challenging outside of the gender binary. And it's also deeply un, 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 unspecial, I suppose, in a racialized sense, because if we were to graph beautifully the like South African publishing industry, it would 100% still be overwhelmingly black, I mean, uh, white cis men that are getting demone. It's not surprising, I'm not even gonna go over that because it's boring. But I think what you get at, which is so much meatier, which I think is so much more, which is challenging and which also brings up my blood pressure a little bit because I, I'm very, I feel it in my body. It's an extremely somatic experience to talk about my gender in this, in this presence of cis people. And in that sense, disclosure, I'm feeling like it's like, it's an, it's like a, it's a somatic thing. Like it's in my bones, like it's like my skin is crawling, even, even here, even in this space, because I'm constantly leveraging and doing the like tap dance of like how safe, how how out can I be here? And I'm embodied in extremely specific ways that are both deliberate and not. There's things that I can help and things that I absolutely can't. And there are ways in which that I'm read and gendered that I both caught and also absolutely um, that invisibilize me in extremely violent and harmful ways. Um, so disclosure and safety and the role of the writer, while also deeply understanding that like I'm a po like like make no mistakes, I am a poet, and poetry even the poetry that I I publish is like access accessible to an extremely small niche of people. But all I can do is hope that my words make it into the hands of of the people that need them and it's and that they are nourishing in that sense. Um, it's so, 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 so difficult to think about myself individually, of course, for sure, because I'm constantly thinking systemically to say, all right. <clears throat> but because I'm thinking systemically, I understand that my presence as a non-binary writer, as a published non-binary writer is already deeply subversive and disruptive. So my role, even if I'm writing about cheesecake, is, is, is still subversive and so much like and this obviously like opens up into another avenue but that that there's a strange and like fucked up imperative inside of like a capitalist lens and dictated by a capitalist capitalist lens that reveals an appetite for trauma from certain like marginalized writers and if you are if you're and, and colleague writes about this very beautifully and i think more explicitly in her newest collection, of which I'm still geeked that I got to 
to edit um, about the dangers and the costs of visibility and fame and celebrity. And I think that when you abstract that and when you look at that structurally, especially when you think about what it means to move as a body across space, like from South Africa to Europe and read the same material in South Africa and read the same material in Europe and <clears throat> the people that are paying for you to go fly and read and the violences, the tiny and large violences that you have to endure from the time you get out of your house. Like it's all there to remind you, to remind you, to remind you. And the only, um, the deep solace that I find, and I suppose why I'm like, yo, why I'm so obsessed, I suppose, in like thinking about empire and thinking about patriarchy and thinking about capitalism and thinking about these structures <clears throat> is that we cannot, you can't see me, I can't speak clearly, I can't speak with my chest and say the things that I actually really want to say um, because of safety, visibility, because of that tension between dis disclosure and um, and visibility. I don't, it's like I feel like I've opened more cans than I closed, but you feel me, I feel you, we're, we're feeling each other, you feel. Yeah, we feel you. <laughs> Thank you, Manea, so much um, for addressing that and also for your time today and speaking with us all, um, incredibly insightful. And um, yeah, I wish we had more moments like these to all convene and discuss these things at length but the lecture will be available up online if any of you would like to share it or re-watch it or if you've missed some of it um, you'll find it on our website in a couple of days just did want to say um, uh, our next guest lecture is on the 7th of April again at 6 p.m um, that will be with Tisetso Mashifane she is on the call right now just spotlighting you Tisetso um, and she'll be speaking to, well, a few things, but the possibility of storytelling, um, but we'll share more details on our website. Um, thank you again, Maneo, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, Koleka, a quick closing note from you as well. No, I'm just sitting with cans, Can open cans. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I love questions, you know, questions make room for other things. And so thank you for taking us down those various avenues um, and giving us more prompts to, to think about and chew on. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you to everyone for your time and for joining us. Um, thank we'll you so you much for having me. Thanks so much for having me and thanks for everybody gathered in the space. And um, I hope that you take care, especially for the trans and non-binary people in the room. I hope that you are able to kind of shake off some dust and do whatever it is that you need to be okay.